Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. As I continue to gather evidence from my hypothesis that the grotto in the Great Pyramid is actually a natural spring, I came across a hypothesis that really got me thinking. The evidence is limited and circumstantial at best, but it does explain a couple of anomalies inside the pyramids of Khafre and Menkore. I've tried to disprove it, but with limited evidence available, it is hard to either prove or disprove. There is a body of thought that the two mentioned pyramids on the Giza Plateau have in fact been reworked and substantially enlarged at least once in their long history. In fact, some even believe that these pyramids didn't reach their current height until much later, possibly even the Sate period, which, as I've discussed in the past, was a time of major building at Giza. If true, it would mean that the Great Pyramid was very much a solitary grand structure and was merely flanked by smaller pyramids, which actually does make sense when we think about just how different the Great Pyramid is to others across Egypt. For example, the quality and workmanship of the Pyramid of Khafre is no way near as good as the Great Pyramid, both internally and externally. The construction is cruder on every level, and apparently there are only shafts and chambers at the very base. Not inside, but it is these shafts that may be the smoking gun, which give us the true history of the pyramids. In truth, we do not know their history. Egyptologists and independent researchers all make assumptions and hypotheses based on limited evidence. For example, people say that Khufu built the Great Pyramid, because his name is written in graffiti inside one of the relieving chambers. Some say this is a hoax by Howard Weiss in the 19th century, but others, including Graham Hancock and John Anthony West, say it isn't a hoax because the paint of one of the cartouches continues on past a joint between two blocks and then continues on behind a wall. Which means the paint had to be done before the upper parts of the pyramid were constructed. You can't paint behind a wall. But what if the Great Pyramid was renovated or repaired in later history? Possibly during the New Kingdom or Sate period. For a start, the cult of Khufu lived on way after his death and all the way up to the 26th dynasty, which means anybody of any age could have painted that cartouche to pay homage to Khufu. It doesn't mean the structure dates to the 4th dynasty. These chambers could have been restored and Khufu's name painted on, which really isn't that strange because Khufu was of high importance all the way through dynastic history. In the world today, people sometimes graffiti the name of Jesus, but that doesn't mean that Jesus is walking around in 2019, just that Jesus remains popular in the current age. A similar thing can be said about Khufu. He remained popular and was idolised up to and into the Sate period. So, even if the cartouches in the relieving chambers are real, it doesn't mean they were done in the Old Kingdom. I'm not saying I believe that the Great Pyramid is a later construction, all I'm saying is we don't know its age, and we also don't know just how much renovation work has taken place over the years. In honesty, we have absolutely no idea. I actually do think the Great Pyramid is the oldest and grandest structure in Egypt, but there is reason to believe that the Menkore and Khafre Pyramids were in fact rebuilt much later. There has been major rebuilding and renovation at Giza throughout history, no question, especially in the 18th and 26th dynasties, as shown by the blocks added to the Sphinx. After looking at this monument in quite some detail, I'm inclined to believe that the Sphinx was first turned into a lion in the 18th dynasty. This doesn't conflict with the Sphinx weathering hypothesis of Robert Schock, as I do think there was a mound of exposed rock on the Giza plateau for many hundreds if not thousands of years. There is Old Kingdom masonry on this rock as well, but I'm yet to see any convincing physical evidence to say that the four paws and tail existed in the Old Kingdom. The head is also clearly a later carving. If someone can present quality physical evidence that shows that the paws and tail existed in the Old Kingdom, I will gladly change my mind. The bedrock found beneath the masonry on the hind paws does have claws etched onto the surface, but the same type of bedrock stone known as Member 1 is greatly eroded on the enclosure wall to the north of the Sphinx, which means that if these claws were original features, they shouldn't really exist anymore. By now, they really should have been eroded away. I think the New Kingdom Egyptians dug down in the Sphinx enclosure, exposed and shaped the Member 1 and Member 2 bedrock below, and then, with the addition of masonry, built them up into paws, added a tail, to turn what was a mound of limestone into a Sphinx lion. 
But no, this video is not about the Sphinx as such, this is just one example of how nobody, however qualified in archaeology or geology, can say hand on heart that this famous Giza monument was any kind of lion or dog in the Old Kingdom or before. In the same respect, nobody can say hand on heart that the pyramids of Khafre and Menkore were not enlarged after the Old Kingdom. As we know, ancient depictions of the pyramids are extremely rare, as are inscriptions. All we know is what we see today, and what I do, and what I've always done, is try to look at Giza objectively. But my main focus is always the anomalies. If we can explain the anomalies, we can explain Giza. But most people tend to overlook them, because it is these anomalies that tend to ruin most hypotheses. Taking my hypothesis regarding the grotto inside the Great Pyramid as an example, if you don't believe what I'm saying in my last video, that it was the location of a natural spring, that is of course absolutely fine. But you need to be able to explain to me why there is earth, sand and gravel inside the chamber. Why it is so crude, why it is built into the pyramid to purposefully join up with the bottom of the Grand Gallery, and why it is wetter than any other part of the pyramid. Another example, again with the Sphinx, and why do the Canaanites and the ancient Egyptians both associate their separate falcon-headed gods, Horus and Horon, to a statue of a lion with a human head? Could it be that the head was once a falcon and not a human? Surely that is logical. When else have Horus and the Canaanite Horon been depicted as lions with human heads? The 18th and 26th dynasties of Egypt were times of Giza restoration and Egyptian cultural revival. We really don't know the scale of work that was done at Giza in these two periods, so we should not assume that everything on the Giza Plateau is still in its old kingdom or pre-dynastic form. So, let's take a look at the anomalies on the two pyramids that led me to believe that these structures were both reworked. Starting with the Pyramid of Menkore, and there is a huge anomaly that most Egyptologists and researchers overlook, because they simply can't explain it. To set the scene, you enter the pyramid from the north face, travel down a descending corridor to a panelled chamber with niches cut into the walls. There were then three large granite portcullis blocks, behind which is a corridor that descends to meet a small undecorated antechamber. The east side of the antechamber sits directly below the axis of the pyramid. There is a rectangular indentation in the floor of the antechamber, which does suggest that a sarcophagus was originally placed there. This is quite common in burial chambers, and is the only obvious explanation for this feature. From this antechamber, as well as the entrance corridor, there are two further passageways that lead off. There is one in the floor that leads down to a horizontal passageway, which connects to what is known as the burial chamber. You then go down again to a chamber with six deep niches, which experts call the cellar. The purpose of these lower compartments is unknown, but due to their style, I do think they are later additions. This is because I believe the antechamber is the true original burial chamber of the Menkore Pyramid. For one, it sits directly beneath the axis of the pyramid, and there is an indentation for a sarcophagus. But the biggest anomaly in the Menkore Pyramid that the experts really can't explain is the third passageway that leads off from the antechamber. Known as the Upper Corridor, it passes directly above the entrance corridor into the body of the pyramid. But mysteriously, it leads nowhere. It is a dead end. Most say that this passageway was abandoned, as the pyramid architect changed his plan during construction. But to me, it is more logical to assume that this structure was rebuilt and enlarged, and that this was the original entrance corridor. Would an architect of such an amazing structure be so bad at his job and change his mind after the work began? Not likely. Assuming that the antechamber was the original Menkore burial chamber, and the upper corridor was the entrance, here is how the Menkore pyramid would have looked. And here we can see its footprint on the Giza Plateau, showing its north-south corridor and east-west burial chamber. A common layout for an Old Kingdom structure. To me, the current layout screams of reworking. On the outside of the pyramid is an inscription thought to be the work of Prince Kenwazet, the son of Ramesses II, which does say that Menkore built the pyramid and also says when he died. Ramesses II was a king of the 19th dynasty, which means that if the pyramid was enlarged, this may have been done in the 18th dynasty. But assuming that the inscription was made by Kenwazet seems to be just guesswork. 
The inscription could also be from the Sate period, which actually does make more sense. Because the wooden coffin inside the pyramid was added in the Sate period, as were the so-called gold tablets found inside the stone sarcophagus, which are likely to be Orphic gold tablets, which are typical of the period. The deepest parts of the internal configuration of the Menkore Pyramid are also reminiscent of the Tomb of Osiris and Campbell's Tomb, both situated west of the Sphinx. We are told that both are St. Period rock-cut structures. There is a domed St. Period tomb at the bottom of Campbell's Tomb, similar to what I think is the new burial chamber for Menkore, and the six large niches at the base of the Menkore Pyramid certainly share similarities to the six niches in the Tomb of Osiris. If the Menkore Pyramid was rebuilt and enlarged, which I think it was, logic says that the Sate Kings did it in the 26th Dynasty. So, what about the Pyramid of Khafre? What evidence is there to say that this is also enlarged? Well, again, it is the layout of the internal chambers that seem to imply that this structure was rebuilt. For a start, although a comparable size, the pyramid as a whole is of a much poorer quality than the Great Pyramid. The latter, with its complex array of internal passages, its precision and encoded complex geometry, together with the quality of stone masonry, certainly implies it was created in a different era of history. And here we see the internal layout of the Khafre Pyramid. As you can see there are two entrances, but there only seems to be one destination. There really is no logical reason to have two ways into the pyramid. But what do the experts say? Once again the anomaly is explained by saying that the architect changed his plan after work began, or he simply made an error. So, let me get this right. The only way for the experts to explain the major anomalies in both the Menkore and Khafre pyramids is by saying the architects changed their plans or made errors after construction began. And they did this twice on two different structures, which certainly seems too ridiculous to be true. Again, with the Khafre Pyramid, the most logical explanation for the two entrances is that one is original and one came later. Assuming that the lower entrance is the original, simply because the upper entrance is cut into the north face of the actual pyramid, based on the original Menkore Pyramid internal layout, this should lead to a subterranean burial chamber. And what do we have at the very bottom of this north-south oriented descending passageway? A chamber that is oriented east-west. This isn't the current Khafre Pyramid burial chamber, which is in the centre of the pyramid, but is this the original? Egyptologists tell us it was possibly a storeroom, or possibly an unfinished or unused burial chamber, but again, it is all guesswork. It is yet another anomaly with no conventional explanation. So, assuming that the lower entrance and descending passageway are original, and the unused chamber was the burial chamber, this could be the original size of the pyramid at this location. As you can see it is far smaller, and here we see its footprint on the Giza Plateau, along with the original footprint of the Menkore Pyramid. Just how different does Giza look, and just how much does the Great Pyramid stand out? The only ancient depiction of the Giza Pyramids and the Sphinx together is on a stela that was discovered inside the Sphinx enclosure in the 1930s, and made in adoration to Horomachet, the name given to the Sphinx in the 18th dynasty. But on this stela, we don't see one pyramid, or even a trio, we only see two pyramids. And although they are stylistic in form, both are large and a similar size. Does this imply that the Khafre Pyramid was renovated and enlarged in the 18th dynasty? We often think of the Giza Pyramids as a trio, not a duo. And although this is barely evidence, I admit that, it is strange to see just two Giza Pyramids and not three. Could it be because the Menkore Pyramid was still a small burial structure in the 18th dynasty? And could the reason the two large pyramids are commemorated on this stela be because the 18th dynasty Egyptians actually built a large pyramid to stand next to that of the Great Pyramid? The reason why they would do this I will come to shortly. Of course, a lot of this is debatable, simply because there are no hard facts to go on. But this can be said about the current accepted history of Giza as well. The second pyramid of Giza is attributed to Khafre simply because Khafre statues were found inside the Valley Temple. His body has never been found inside the pyramid, only the bones of a bull, and there are no inscriptions on the walls. The same can be said with the Sphinx. Apart from one mutilated line on the granite dream stealer of Tutmose IV, which I have to say proves nothing, there is not a single ancient inscription that connects the Sphinx with Khafre. 
The Dream Stealer says Kaf, not Kafre, and it doesn't say that this Kaf created the Sphinx or the Pyramid. But we do have a vast amount of evidence to know for sure that there was a great deal of work at Giza during the 18th dynasty. We know that Amenhotep II built a new Sphinx temple, and we know that his son, Tutmos IV, renovated the Sphinx, and I would also suggest that it was him that turned it into a lion, which became known as Horamaket. We also know that Amenhotep II referred to the pyramids as the Pyramids of Horamaket, as Dr. Selim Hassan discovered a limestone stealer close to the Sphinx that says this. Horamaket translated means Horus in the horizon. So, in the 18th dynasty, the pyramids were referred to as the Pyramids of Horus in the Horizon, with the sun god Horus of course being portrayed by the Sphinx. Interestingly, on the summer solstice, the hieroglyph Akhet is seen on a grand scale on the Giza Plateau. The sun sets between the Great Pyramid and the Pyramid of Khafre, and the Sphinx marks the position of the setting sun when you stand from a specific location east of Giza. This is no coincidence as Horus is the sun god. The Sphinx literally is Horus in the horizon, and the pyramids are the two mountains of the Akhet symbol. But there is doubt about whether this was part of the original ancient Giza master plan, or whether this is, in fact, an 18th dynasty plan from when they transformed the landscape. The reason why it could be an 18th dynasty plan is because the Sphinx was not referred to as Horus in the horizon any time before the 18th dynasty, and although the evidence is by no means conclusive, I do think that the Pyramid of Khafre was reworked and enlarged at this time. This would truly justify the new name of the Sphinx. The Sphinx was known as Horus in the horizon, as that's what the monument and the Giza Plateau became. It was now a sacred landscape dedicated to Horamaket. What we do know is that the Khafre Causeway forms the southern boundary of the Sphinx enclosure. This monument is very much part of the Khafre Pyramid Complex. So, if the Sphinx was turned into a lion in the 18th dynasty, with possibly the head reshaped, maybe the pyramid was also renovated and transformed at this time. All part of one plan. It didn't need complex internal passages like the Great Pyramid, because this pyramid was symbolic. The most important thing was how it looked from the outside, so that visually, it was of a similar height to the Great Pyramid. It's something I can't prove, but it's something we also can't disprove, and this video is really something for us to think about. Evidence for any theory on Giza is far from conclusive, so we do have to keep an open mind, follow the evidence, and try and understand the anomalies. So, here is a new possible timeline of the Giza Plateau. In pre-dynastic or very old kingdom times, the Great Pyramid was built, not as a tomb, but for some unknown function which we can debate forever. When out of use, I believe that Khufu renovated it in some way, and he turned it into his own tomb. I also believe he turned Giza into a sacred landscape dedicated to the powerful god of Lower Egypt, Sokar. In these Old Kingdom times, the mound of rock we call the Sphinx may well have been a representation of the sacred mound of Sokar, used in the ancient ceremonies of Rostau, with the falcon head of Sokar, the powerful Old Kingdom god, the Lord of Rostau, carved on top, looking out to the rising equinox sun in the east. I have already made videos on this, and they are linked below in the description. In these early times, there is evidence to believe that Giza was a sacred landscape dedicated to the rites and rituals around the god Sokar, and his sacred boat, the Henu Bark. We also know that in Old Kingdom times, Giza was referred to as Rostau, the name of the ancient Egyptian underworld, and at this time the god of the underworld was Sokar. The kings and queens that came after Khufu were buried on the plateau around the Great Pyramid, and they built their own pyramids above their tombs, just as we see with the Nubian pyramids. These later Giza pyramids, like the Nubian ones, were far smaller than the Great Pyramid, but pyramid-shaped in homage to the iconic symbol of Giza and Rostau. Then, I believe the Giza plateau was long neglected after conflicts and power struggles. But, in the 18th dynasty, Giza was a focal point once again, and we know that it was renovated on a huge scale. The work may have lasted a dynasty, through numerous pharaohs, but I think this is when the Sokar falcon-headed mound became the human-headed lion, and the 18th dynasty rulers referred to it as Horamaket, Horus in the horizon. The name links the monument to its earlier incarnation as a falcon-headed monument, but now includes lion symbolism, as the lion has long been associated with the sun, strength, and kingship. 
The head was possibly recarved to that of an 18th dynasty pharaoh, as dynastic pharaohs were known as the Horus kings, and it was probably carved by Amenhotep II or Tutmos IV. But the name Horamaket was given for a reason. It was the dawning of a new age, a new era of Giza history, and a relatively small pyramid was greatly enlarged to sit together with the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. The Sphinx would now mark sunset in the west, directly between the two large pyramids, on the longest day of the year, the summer solstice. Giza was now all about Horus in the horizon. This new Giza sun cult would inevitably culminate in the creation of a new monotheistic religion under Akhenaten, a king who would often portray himself as a sphinx. The Menkore pyramid did not feature at this time. The strange masonry boxes that flanked the sphinx were created in the 18th dynasty and they do not show any alignments to the Menkore pyramid, yet they are precisely aligned to every other prominent Giza structure as shown in a previous video. But this is because I believe the Menkore Pyramid was enlarged and redeveloped in the Sate period, the 26th dynasty, as discussed already. The Giza landscape is not as straightforward as we are told. We have no reason to believe that three Old Kingdom kings built three large pyramids and a sphinx, and then the Egyptians left the plateau untouched for the next two and a half thousand years. I do think that those three Old Kingdom kings were laid to rest at Giza, just that one of their pyramids predated Giza, and the other two were enlarged after the Old Kingdom. So, I believe that in Old Kingdom times, Khufu renovated Giza to be a ritual landscape for Sokar, then in the New Kingdom it was turned into a ritual landscape for Horus, also known as Horamaket, and finally, in the Sate period, it became a ritual landscape to celebrate Egyptian culture after a long period of turmoil. But, with all this said, I do think the Great Pyramid came first. Perhaps it was renovated and reworked, but it truly is a structure unrivaled in the ancient world, and one that will no doubt outlive us all. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.